Well, praise God. Hallelujah. Y'all doing okay tonight? I hope you are. We, we're, we're few, but hey, listen, the Lord can do a lot with just a handful. Amen. I believe that. So this is uh, this little slide here is just some little pictures, huh? Because I titled my message tonight. I was, I was going to, you know, Danielle's like, she's, she's hounding me for a title because she can't set this thing up unless there's a title. I did not realize that. But anyway, I tried to put, I was going to try to tell her that we were going to call it the stick in the spokes. She said, no, you've already done that before. I said, recently? Okay, this is probably the sixth time I've preached this passage of scripture since we've had the church. So what I did was instead I called it something different. We called it tonight a broken engine, okay? Romans 7 verses 1 through 11. We're going to just pray real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, we need your help tonight. Holy Spirit, we need you to be the preacher and the teacher. Lord, we need you to anoint the ears of the hearer and open the eyes of the of the the, the person that's going to hear this message because I know that this is not easy information to understand but Holy Spirit if you would just show up Lord God and minister to our hearts and minds then you make it easy Lord God which is impossible with man there's nothing impossible with you Lord so we look to you the author and the finisher of our faith and put our hope and trust in you Lord in Jesus name amen so Romans chapter 7 Verses 1 through 11. Maybe the best way to handle tonight is just to go ahead and kind of read all 11 verses and then we'll go back and we'll go through it. Amen? All right, so here we go. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead... She is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ." that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Maybe you don't realize I didn't put this in my notes, but the concept of covetousness is very interconnected to the concept of lust because the idea of lust is that you desire something that really doesn't belong to you, whatever that may be. All right. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. That's a fancy word. It's an old outdated word that means all kind of lustful sin. All right. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But with, and that's, that's an interesting, I'm going to go ahead and highlight that because I just want to point that out. I mean, we're going we're gonna to break it down here in a moment, but... This is, this is kind of like the pivot point of this chapter, and, and, and I feel like the best thing I can tell you is that the way that I received the revelation of this particular verse, which was a huge thing that really, really had an impact in my understanding of the Bible overall, was my sister Debbie had bought some VHS tapes from Brother Swaggart's ministry, and it was Brother Swaggart, Lauren Larson. This is before I ever went to any camp meeting as far as I know. Brother Larson and maybe one other guy, I can't remember who, and they were talking about this. And when Lauren began to describe this particular verse, I'm telling you there was a download in my living room. I had a TV tray. It was nine hours on a Saturday. It was back before I had to work too much on Saturdays. And I was sitting there just taking notes, pausing, taking notes, pausing, taking notes. And when he got to this verse right here, I'm telling you, when he said what he said, the Holy Spirit 
like open my eyes. That's what we need to happen tonight because I'm going to be honest with you. This passage of scripture, at least in my opinion, is not always the easiest to understand. And I don't think I have the, the ability to explain it, but the Holy Spirit surely has the ability to explain it. All right. So for I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. So let's just go ahead and we're, we're going to go back to the top and we're going we're gonna to pray that the Lord helps, uh, helps me to explain it and helps you to understand it. How's that sound? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your beautiful word. Lord God, we know that your word is the truth, Lord. And Jesus, you said that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be the preacher and the teacher tonight, Lord, and that you would anoint and ignite the word of God, Lord. But that, Lord, you would also anoint the ears of the hearer, Lord God, that they might be able to understand. Lord, give us hearts to receive the truth. Let your word be like seed on fertile soil. Let it produce a harvest in our hearts and lives, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so in this first verse, you know, one of the things that he points out is he says, know ye not, brethren, and then he says, for I speak to them that know the law. So one of the first things that I want to point out to you is, is that the Roman church, if you know anything about geography, I know I try to draw maps and stuff. I'm not going to do that right now. But, but Rome is in Italy. And one of the things that I've tra- tried to show you before when I went and got a globe, I've made this point before, where we spin the globe, we find Israel. We, you, can, you can't even see it, obviously, on the globe. You wouldn't be able to see it anyway. But in addition to that, it's about that big on the globe, and you got every other nation around there, every other nation in the world that is not Israel is considered a Gentile nation, okay? And so Rome existed, the church of Rome existed within the midst of a, not just just a regular old Gentile nation, but a very pagan, all the nations were pagan, but Rome was very paganized, okay? And so the main point that I'm trying to make is, is that when he writes this letter, there's no way that he's speaking only to Jews, Instead, what I need you to understand is that the church of Rome was made up of both Jews that had been saved and then also Gentiles that had been saved, okay? So why would he be talking about the law? Because people, whenever they get saved and they have information about the Word of God and they cover information connected to the law, it's part of our learning. You know, I was starting to read this. I I got this app on my phone, and it sends me these scholarly theological papers, and I don't typically read them because they're real long, but I've been getting updates. Well, the other day I read, uh, you know, the first couple of pages of one, and it was about Phoebe. And I thought it was very interesting. I'm not done with it. I'm going to finish it. Because I've always said in my heart, you know, there's a lot of preachers out there that don't believe in women preachers. And I got, I mean, I got, personally, I got a problem with that because I got saved under a woman's ministry. But in addition to that, I always thought about Phoebe. Now, now you got to understand, like, this is a power. Who is Phoebe? Well, in, if you read Romans chapter, chapter 16 and you read to the end, you'll see Paul commend Phoebe to the church of Rome because she's on her way. On, on a, well, she's, she is on her way once they get it. She's already been there because she's the one that's carrying it. Now, that may not seem like a big deal to you. You know what I'm saying? Hey, Rob, I need you whenever you go to Denver next time. I need you to go ahead and carry this little paperwork that, I'm gonna, that I want you to give to, you know, to Ridge when you see him. And, uh, and, and it's important. Now, Rob's going to believe that. He's going to believe it's important because it's about the Word of God. But look, I, you know, it's easy to trust Rob. He's a, he's a responsible guy. He's probably going to get on a plane pretty, you know, pretty easy going. It shouldn't be too much difficulty getting on a plane and flying over there and landing. You might have to rent a car to get over there. This isn't the case for Phoebe. Phoebe is carrying this scroll inside of her cloak, and she's on a sailboat in the midst of the Mediterranean Sea, and she's having to traverse the the elements in order to get this so important letter that you and I sometimes could take for granted to the church of Rome. And so what, what I'm trying to say, though, is this, is that in this letter, in this article that I've been reading, they've been making the point by some of the words that are used to describe Phoebe that it's very likely that, that she was a leader in the church where she was coming from, if not the actual pastor of the church. And one day maybe we'll get into that. But, but what's, what's interesting to me is that the Apostle Paul has to be explaining these 
concepts, these theological concepts to the people that are around him. And so he's having to trust in Phoebe because you can't just deliver a scroll to the church over there and say, here you go, good reading. No, they're going to need to understand things that are interconnected with the letter. Does that make sense? You need to understand because it's got some deep theological truths in it. So the church of Rome was made up of Jews and both Gentiles, but he makes this statement and it's very specific. Did you not know that as long as a man Man lives, the law has dominion over him. So the point that it needs to be made here is that death can refer in this passage of scripture, I believe, to both physical but also spiritual death in Christ, depending on whether we're addressing a believer or an unbeliever. Well, well what do you mean? Well, number one, see the human heart or the human being that refuses to accept Jesus will have the law as his Lord. By the way, that's what the word dominion means. It's describing lordship. So as long as this human being that refuses Jesus, the law will be his Lord until he dies. All right, And then he will be spiritually judged under the law of God. And once found guilty, he will be transferred from the dominion of law to the judgment of hell. Does that make sense? So listen, the, the word of God even says this in Galatians 4, verse 4. I didn't put it in my notes. But in Galatians 4, 4, it says that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a w- woman, born under law. I need you to understand that since the law came into existence, and I've tried to explain it before, the law has dominion over every human being that has ever been born since the advent of the law. Because it's God's standard, and it's God's word. Whether or not you live, you're a Hindu in India or you, know, you believe in El Muerte, the God of death in South America or Mexico, it doesn't really matter. The, the truth of the matter is this is God's earth, the, the devil's a good devil, and he's a deceiver, and he's, and he's able to keep the truth, the, the word of truth, out of the hearts and lives of people, but, that, but ignorance of the law is no excuse. And because he's done such a good, good job of deceiving, many people haven't heard. But the point that I need you to understand is, is that human beings are under the lordship of the law. So he says, as long as he lives, all right? But... Once he dies, he will go from transfer from being under just the dominion of law to the judgment of hell. But look, the spiritual application is different for a believer. For the believer, physical death is really just a transference into eternal life. Amen? That's good right there. For, for, for the physical death for a believer is just a transference into eternal life. But spiritually speaking, the old man dies with Jesus on the cross through faith. So in God's mind, let's understand that there's a transference that takes place at the very moment that a person is genuinely saved. And what happens is, is that now they're dying to the law. We're going to break it down a little bit more, but does that make sense? Because look, in Romans 6, we learned that you die to what through Jesus? To sin, to the sinful nature. Remember that? The sin, ha, hamartia, we drew it on the board, right? So we die not just to the penalty of sin, but we also die to the power of sin in Christ Jesus, all right? So, but, but what Paul's saying is you didn't just die to sin, you also died to the, to the dominion of the law, to the power that the law exerts over you, okay? You're so, you, in Christ, you died to that power that the law had over you. So in God's mind, This transference that takes place at the very moment that a person is genuinely saved. There's a lot of transferences that are taking place, but just to be simple, you're transferred from guilt to righteousness. You're transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Lord. That's Colossians. You're transferred from the dominion of law into the dominion of grace. So now your Lord is Jesus, but now you're living in a new kingdom. And in the new kingdom, there's grace flowing. Amen? Amen. And look, this goes along with, because look, this is where we were coming. I just want to remind you of where we've been. All this wording that we're talking about right now comes off the heels of Romans 6, 14, where we left the last, last, the last time in chapter 6, where it says, for sin, look at this, sin shall not have dominion over you. Tonight, we're saying the law shall not have dominion over you, but sin shall not have dominion over you. Why, Paul? For you are not under the law, 
but under grace. So I need you to understand the context of what we're talking here. We're, whenever we're talking about that we're, we're no longer under the dominion of the law, there's a reason why. Because Paul is saying that we died in, to sin when we, when we were united with Christ. When we were united with Jesus through faith and we died with Jesus and we're buried with Jesus and a new man has been resurrected to newness of life. So not only did we die to sin, the penalty of sin to where we can make it to heaven and we receive righteousness, but we also died to the power that sin held over us. And what we're going to learn in Romans 7 is that there's a very close connection between the law and the power of sin. All right, And so God wants you and I to know that you also died, that the law is, is, is not your Lord. Okay, so now transitioning into, uh, into to verse 2 real quick. Uh, I want you to see that in verses 2 and 3, the Apostle Paul uses marriage as an illustration. I want you to understand that. Because look, for the longest time when I first read this passage of Scripture, I used to think it was divorce. I've heard people preaching it about divorce. This message, this verse has nothing to do with divorce. None at all. <laughs> okay, now it does have truth. You could maybe in a roundabout way say, you know, that that's one thing that frees you from a literal marriage in the mind of God is that one of the spouses, one of the people dies. That releases you in a marriage situation. There's other things that will release you in a marriage situation. But anyway, the main thing that I want you to understand is that this is an illustration, right? Okay, and so let's go ahead and read verses 2 and 3 again. He says, For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband is dead, she's loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. All right, so in verse 2, he introduces the idea of this illustration through marriage that the woman has a husband and that she's bound by the law until unless he was to die, right? So that's that's the simple simple illustration of it using law the law of marriage the law holds her connected to the marriage as long as the husband lives death severs her from the relationship with the husband, right? So for illustrative purposes the law the husband is the law Okay, does that make sense? That's what we got to understand here. The husband is the law. The wife is the believer. But more specifically, listen, if you hold true to that, it makes it very difficult to understand what Paul's really trying to get across here. So more specifically, it makes more sense if the marriage relationship is viewed as the individual's relationship before and after salvation. So that's a lot of information right there, right? So what, what are you trying to say? Instead of focusing on the man being the law and the woman being the bride, let's look at the, just a relationship in marriage. And let's understand it like this, that in a relationship based on this context, if someone dies, it changes the relationship. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Death changes the relationship. Amen? All right, so I want you to see that. All right. In other words, before salvation, the sinner was married to law. After salvation, the believer is no longer married to law. Rather, the new man is married to Jesus. Amen? The point of emphasis is not who died. Rather, the point of emphasis is that death changed the relationship. For the wife, she is released by God from the marriage to her husband because he is dead now. For the believer, he or she is released from their relationship to the law because the old man that was born under the dominion of law in their physical birth with Adam has died to the old life, died to sin, and also died to the dominion of law. Amen? Hopefully that makes sense. All right. So if we're staying true to the illustration and she the wife, in verse 3, has a relationship with another while she's married, then she is an adulteress. Because why? Because she's trying to have a relationship with two different people at the same time. That's not going to really work, is it? No. If the believer attempts to live for God through law, he is no longer living under grace. He's attempting to carry on a relationship in two covenants at the same time. 
Does that make sense? If, a, if a, you, you weren't saved before, I don't care if you're a Jew or a Gentile. You were under the dominion of the law in your first birth of Adam. And then you got saved. Okay. And so now that you're saved, if you attempt or try to live under both covenants at the same time, then now you're going against God's will. Look, Jesus says you can't do that. Jesus says you can't live in two covenants at the same time. Well, let me give you some scriptural evidence for that. Matthew chapter 9, this might be a cool little verse of scripture because some people maybe have always wondered what it meant. Maybe not. Maybe you already know. Jesus says this, No man puts a piece of new cloth on an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up takes from the garment, and the rip is made worse. What are you talking about? Okay, I'm going to tell you what you're talking about. You have an old garment that's been washed on multiple occasions and it's been hung to dry in the sun because they didn't have dryers back then. And that cloth or material has began to shrink. Then you take a new patch. It's got a hole in it. You take a new patch and you sew it on the old garment that has already shrunk. Then you go and you wash the garment again and you put it out to dry. What happens? The patch now shrinks and tears and makes the rip worse than it was before. So what you got to understand is this. The old garment represents represents the old covenant. The new patch represents the new covenant. The two of them are not congruent. You can't have both of them going on at the same time. And then he goes on to say this, neither do men put new wine into old bottles or else the bottles break. The wine runs out, the bottles perish, but they put new wine in the new bottles and both are Preserved. Dude, that's so beautiful right there. I mean, I'm just sorry. Like, you become the new wineskin that carries the new life of the new covenant on the inside of you. You can't keep functioning the old way like you used to before Christ. But this is the problem. I need you to understand this. I want y'all to stay awake for this just one little moment right here. It's so important that you understand this. Most of you don't even realize whenever you're living under law. Because you think, I'm not quoting the Ten Commandments every day and trying to keep the Ten It's deeper than that. It's so much deeper than that. The essence of living under law is self-dependence. Trying in your own strength according to your own willpower. Your willpower ain't going to get it done, my friend. You might be able to say, oh, well, I didn't do this or I didn't do that. And look at him over there. Look at her over there. That's not true righteousness. I'm getting ahead of myself in my notes. I know I am. But listen, that's not true righteousness. We already learned in Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, has been revealed. His name is Jesus. Righteousness from God is Jesus. Why? Because in the end, in Revelation chapter 5, it's like, why do you weep, sir? Because nobody's worthy. Nobody's worthy to open the scroll. And he said, no, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. He is worthy. Because when you look around, nobody's worthy because everybody's, in, everybody's born in sin. But Jesus was not born in sin. And he laid his sinless life down as a sacrifice to pay the penalty. That's God's righteousness. And there was a transference that took place. Listen, this is a problem in the church. Whenever we look at somebody else's failure and we're like, hmm, I didn't do that. What did you do, dude? It, Chick? Yeah. Well, they don't even say that anymore. What did you do, mama? What did you do? What do you do? Because the problem is, is that you got something, like Brad used to say. I know it's gross. A booger in your biscuit. You got your own boogers in your biscuit. It's gross. But that's what I think the intent is to make you... To make you be feel skirmish because it's gross. You got something going on and you need the Lord to deal with it. Amen. And if you don't have the right attitude about it, then God can't even deal with you. you over, we over here crying out to the Lord to minister to our hearts. Do we not? We do. But yet at the same time, we're over here. See, what it's called, it's, it's called relative righteousness. Relative. You see, you can have, there's two kinds of righteousness. You can have imputed, 
That's a big old fancy word. What does that mean? It means basically to be laid upon. It means to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. It's a gift that's laid upon you. That's what the word imputed means. It's given to you. God put righteousness on you. He put Jesus' righteousness on you based on faith. That's what you did right. One time in your life, you put faith in Christ. Amen? And God said, okay, here's the gift. You get this gift. But this is the difference. Here's relative righteousness. Relative righteousness is a very, it's a, it's a messed up deal. And we've all dealt with it, and some of us might still be dealing with it. What is relative right? We, every last Christian has at some point in time dealt with relative righteousness. When in our own heart and in our own mind, we look at someone else and we say, relative to such and such, I'm doing really good. That's not the righteousness of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Filthy rags. And we all know what that, most of us know what that is, but it's menstrual pads. They didn't have pads back then, but that's what it is. Okay, so that's what God thinks about not so much our works of righteousness. I'm pretty sure God loves our works of righteousness when they're done from the right heart, the right motive, and we're out there doing works of righteousness to lead other people to Christ, amen, and we're doing the work of the ministry, and we're ministering to people. God loves that because we're, we're sold out. We're bought, we've bought in. But when we try to produce works of righteousness in order to try to gain favor with God or we view in our own hearts and minds, I'm better than this person here or I'm more righteous than this person because I didn't do that, but yet we can't recognize what's in our own heart. We got a problem. That's a problem, yeah. right? So anyway, in the new, if you, if you, if you put... If you put new wine in old wine skins, it's not going to work. It's going gonna, it's gonna to burst it, and, it, and it's, it, everything's going to spill out, right? All right, so we're going back to Romans. So you can't do that. You can't live in both covenants at the same time. So you can't be a believer and attempt to live for God according to law because that would be unfaithful. All right, so let's explain the essence of how a person would live under law. All right, so I've already said it a little bit, but let me repeat it. He would be trusting or depending on his own works and his own strength for righteousness. Because while the law informs God's people of what is expected regarding their behavior, let me just go ahead and slow that down again. Let me read it again. While the law informs God's people of what is expected regarding their behavior, there is no indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit to help the believer accomplish what is expected when he's not saved, right? When a person is not saved, there's no indwelling presence. Now, this is the tricky part. You can be saved, and if you don't understand what we're talking about, you could still be living as an unbeliever. Your relationship to sin, the power of sin, could still be raging in your life because you don't understand the things that we're talking about right here. And that's what we're going to find out as Paul moves forward is that that was the very thing that he was struggling with. And that's why he wrote, I believe the Holy Spirit had him write this chapter. Okay. All right. So in verse four, wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So in our relationship with Christ through faith, in God the Father's mind, we died with Jesus on the cross. We were buried with Jesus in the tomb. We resurrected with Jesus into newness of life. That means that through, what our, through our connection to Jesus, sin no longer is our master. Okay, The law no longer has lordship over us. So the, this person's first marriage and his first, first birth is to law. All right? A system of performance that gives no strength for change, but demands that things be done right. How many times have you been there? If you're honest with yourself, we've all been there. We find ourselves in the midst of a situation where we want to do right, but we don't have the strength resident in us to do what is right. Through salvation, there's a change in relationships. The first marriage is dissolved by death. The new marriage between Jesus and the believer is a marriage of grace. I still, I've preached it before, but I just think it is the most, it didn't hit me all at once. It kind of like was progressive. 
But just the story of Abigail. If y'all know the story of Abigail in the Old Testament, to me, that's an Old Testament passage that perfectly preaches Romans 7. I love that story. That, that part of the story, if you don't remember the story, I'm going to try to shoot from the hip. I didn't go back and read. Um, but Abigail, Abigail had a husband, and his name was Nabal. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's spelled N-A-B-A-L, Nabal. And the Bible says of Nabal that he was a curlish man. And what does it mean, curlish? We don't even use that word anymore. It means he was a taskmaster. He was mean. He was hardcore, bro, and he was rich. He had all kind of stuff. And look, David sent some of his men over there to try to ask to receive something because they were kind of like in a little bit of a bind. And Nabal said, I don't know this David. He said, I serve Saul. And so what I'm gonna, well, why would I want to bother giving you anything? And David, David made sure you know, that he understood that, listen, we protected your flocks whenever some of these other people were coming around. Long story short, Nabal died. See, Abigail freaks out because she's like, because David, this is the place in the King James Bible where he says, by the morning time, there will not be left one that pisseth against the wall. What, is it? what did he mean? It's in the King James. David said, because we're about to slaughter all the men that belong to Nabal. They're about to all go down. There ain't going to be no man left standing. All right. Well, Abigail hears the story and she just brings all kind of fruit. Like, I can't even remember, figs and pomegranates, just all kind of stuff. Fruit and cheese and all, just a big old, just got to, you know. So, so she's coming over here to reach out to the king, and she's like, please, my, my lord, don't, don't hold your servant, he's t- she's talking about herself, accountable for him. You see, he, he, he's not right. Please take this offering. And, you know, and, he, and he, David blessed her, but what's crazy is, is that they had a party the next day, if I'm not mistaken, it might have been the next day, and he was drinking, and he was being merry with the wine, is what it said. And all of a sudden, his heart, the Bible says, I believe he had an MI, is what we call it in medicine, a heart attack. It says that his heart turned to stone, and he died right then and there. And then David took Abigail to be his wife. <laughs> what a beautiful picture of the Old Testament law that holds you in bondage and demands things from people that they cannot give dies, hallelujah, in Christ, and that the bride now is married to the king, which is a type of Christ. But so when in Christ, the grace of God nourishes and cherishes and causes growth. If a husband under, if a husband understands his relationship to Christ, then proper faith will produce a new creation. However, improper faith in a system of law will result in the law dominating the man, and many times it will result in a similar manifestation where the husband wants to dominate the wife, or it can't happen vice versa. Wives, don't, don't, don't be tricked. Eve talked Adam into something. She, she did. She, she knew. She was deceived, and Adam, just like, like a little cowering kid, I guess, gave in. But I'm just saying, we can, we can be honest with each other, right? We might even have the men out, outnumbering the women tonight. We can be honest with one another, and we can say that, yes, men are a mess. We understand that. But it's not always the man. Like, in every situation and circumstance, it's not always the man. As a matter of fact, women have a really hard time with not trying to dominate a man. Is that true? Yes, it's true. <laughs> Trying to talk the man into stuff. Like Eve tried to talk Adam into stuff. And if they don't get it their way, what do they do? Can, is it okay if I say this? Yeah, it's okay because it's real. I'm not talking about you, Danielle. I'm just talking about <laughs> women in general. I'm just talking about women in general. She's like, where are you coming from? With all this stuff, dude, she's like, I have been nothing but submissive for all of our lives, and here you come in with this stuff. I've watched other women and how they treat their men, okay? <laughs> but, or I've worked with women. I, I'm not, I love women, man. Women are awesome. They do more work in the kingdom of God than men do. So it's not about that, right? I say it at the weddings whenever I do weddings. I say it. I said, I feel like God says, husbands, we're about to go to the scripture. Let's just go to the scripture real quick. Ephesians chapter 5, and let me back out of this bad boy here. <laughs> let me back out of this bad boy. All right. 
<laughs> this is one of my favorite little wedding passages. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. I like that part because this was revelation for me. This is really describing a man and a woman, and we're about to transition to a husband and a wife, as being really kind of like brothers and sisters, right? So what I'm trying to say, like in other words, submit submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So it's about to transition into a husband and a wife, but in a body, in the body of Christ, it's made up of men and women, correct? And so what it's supposed to say, what it's what I believe you could say in an in a, a gender between a man and a woman in the church, we're brothers and sisters. Does that make sense? Right. So we're brothers and sisters. I heard an old, uh, old African-American lady one time tell me we was talking about Jesus in the clinic. And boy, she got to preaching. And I'm like, man, I don't try to te tell them girls, you know, when they were young and blah, blah, blah. She said, let me tell you something, honey. I try to tell them this, that until they husband and wife, they brother and sister in the Lord. Isn't that good? That's good right there. See, because, because this is one of the things that I think we need to understand. God has a, a, a hierarchy of how he has set up a marriage. All right, now this is my take on it. It's my opinion on the scripture. You do what you want with the scripture, but I'm telling you what I believe the scripture is saying. That before they were ever husband and wife, they were brother and sister in the Lord. And the Lord said we're to submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. That means that the man is not supposed to be like Nabal and curlish and mean and brutish and like demanding that the woman listen. And, you know, like uh, I tell the story all the time. My mom is not here, but she told this story before that my dad would come home from offshore and he literally had a white glove. Like, who's ever heard of such a thing? Like, what kind of egotistical, narcissistic maniac is that? He put on a white glove, and he'd rub it upon the, the refrigerator. <laughs> Dude, that's just ridiculous. I mean, I'm bad, but I ain't that bad. Come on now. And he'd rub that on the, and he'd say, what is this, Elaine? Yeah. So I don't, look. So what I'm trying to say, though, is this, is that men have this tendency to where they want to lord over a woman and they want to demand that this woman listen i'm just being real with you because i've felt it in my spirit a long long time ago that a man wants to lord over a woman and control her and tell her what to do but in christ that there's supposed to be a new heart yes god has set it up to the fact that wives are to submit themselves to their own husbands as unto the lord you don't have to like it if you don't want to. You don't have to like me if you don't want to. I didn't write it. That's the word of the Lord. The Lord said, wives, submit yourselves to your husband. There is no greater grievance for a man's heart than for him to try to, listen, I'm just trying to say, trying to have some kind of normalcy going on and you have a woman in a relationship that just purposefully, <laughs> purposefully, does it her way, and she don't care what anybody else has to say. Dude, that's, a, that's, a, that's the spirit of Jezebel. That's the spirit of Jezebel, my friend. It's rebellion against authority. God has placed the man as the authority in the home. And the excuse is, yeah, but my man don't get into the word like me. My man don't understand the word like I do. Well, guess what, sis? Maybe you need to start having a Bible study with the brother and you need to bring him along. I don't know what the answer is. And listen, I'm not trying to get you because, you know, Sierra would say that, but daddy, what if they lead me down the wrong path? Well, don't go down the wrong path, boo. Don't let that man bring you down the wrong path. Yeah, give that brother some correction. You're going in the wrong direction, dude. As for me and my house, whether you're part of it or not, we will serve the Lord. What I'm trying to say is there's a balance in this. Amen. Amen. You're not, you're not to, you got to submit yourself to Jesus before you submit yourself to a man. And if the man's going to try to get you to pull away from Jesus, you don't need that man. Or you don't need to be, you don't need to be living with that man. Or, or let me just be careful. You don't need to listen to that man in that situation, in that moment, in that circumstance. But if that man is trying to be, hearing from the Lord and trying to help make some decisions, you can't just be cutting him off at the knees every time you turn around. You can't do that. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, 
It is not going to go good, gentlemen, if you trying to talk about, did you not remember Ephesians and you sit there and you try to talk like that? Because then we got to pull in the proverb that says a soft answer turns away wrath. Even the fool (laughs) is perceived as wise when he shuts his lips, right? Sometimes I'm just trying to say there's a time and a place for everything. And sometimes it'd be best had you not said it in such a cocky manner, or had I not said it in such a cocky manner? Because if we're really just trying, I mean, is that not really going to work real good? Well, the word says for you to submit to me, woman. I mean, if it works for you. But all I know is, is that uh, most of the women that I know ain't going to really go for that. There might be some out there, but they ain't going to, you're going to get some lip trust, right? That's right. (laughs) You might say, yup. We come around here with all that stuff. All right. So the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Dude, isn't that good? Oh, man, that rebukes me every time I read it, right? But because of what I'm trying to say is, is that there's another thing that I've learned about men. And I might be wrong. Not, not, this doesn't attribute to every man, and certainly probably not every man in this place. We all are at differing levels, and some of y'all may have already arrived. But a lot of the men that I have known, and myself included, can be very narcissistic, meaning, like, I'm all that in a bag of chips. And I know they don't say that anymore. It's kind of weird, but I'm just saying. Or we think so in our mind. And... We're to love our wives as Jesus loved the church, but what ends up happening is really, truly, I don't love much of nothing more than I love myself other than maybe Jesus. So it's kind of hard for me to love my wife as Jesus loved the church when I love myself so much, and I want what I want. You see what I'm saying? So isn't that amazing how the word of the Lord would say, if you just take the whole situation from the fall and you see how men love what they love, and they want to do what they want to do. And, then, and, and God already knew that was a problem because he can see it. It's part of the fall. And then, and then women, they kind of want to nag, and they don't want to submit. And they want, like, you know, it's in their nature. I'm not saying that there's no women that submit. Y'all, y'all get that point, right? I don't have to overtalk all that. Y'all get the point I'm trying to make. And so what I'm trying to say is that this is something that the male gender deals with. He struggles with this because he loves himself and all of his own stuff. He loves football games, and he loves bass boats, and he loves hunting, and he loves fishing, and he loves all this stuff, right? And, and, and at the same time, for the woman, it's difficult for her to submit herself according to God's will. All right. So hopefully that made a little bit of sense and helped out a little bit. We were talking about, I guess, marriage there, but really what we were talking about is nourishing and cherishing that like Nabal was towards Abigail, he was very very strong-handed and whatnot, and then he dies, and in the same way that the believer before Christ was living under this system of law, heavy-handedness, but now in Christ, we have a new relationship, amen, and like the scripture said in Ephesians, that's what I was really trying to point out, is that he nourishes and cherishes, all right, and it causes growth, amen, all right, so praise God. For the Lord, amen, and what he does in our hearts and lives. All right, so Romans 7, 5, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So I want you to see this word flesh right here in the Greek language. Is, it's kind of like a different kind of word. I don't, it's the, well, it's sarx. Is, is, but many times the, the word itself, when it's used in this context, is describing the sinful nature, okay, flared up and exhibiting itself in the life of the believer. So sometimes the word flesh can be used in various ways. I don't really want to get into all that. Like, in other words, he born in the flesh, that means your physical birth. But when it's used like this, it's talking about the flesh that's tainted by sin, right? And so now it's describing the sinful nature. Okay, for when we were in the flesh or before Christ or after Christ, if you don't know how to walk with the Lord, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So many of you know, now now everybody might be a little bit different, but before Christ, uh, before Jesus, you just really didn't care at all. 
Like about, like for the most part, you just do your thing, right? I remember when I went back to Lafayette, this was a new little saying. I know it's old now, but they were like, man, he said, my, one of my old friends, Kevin, he said, ain't got no shame in my game. And he was, he was right. I, I knew him in the past. I just never heard that saying before. This dude had no shame in his game, and he'd rip off anybody. <laughs> he'd do them dirty, and he just did not care. And that's how he was, and he said he was going to be. And look, but, but that, that's it. They, they have no, before Christ, we had no shame in our game. Different levels of that. We just do it. We just live to please the flesh. But then once you give your heart to the Lord, you, it becomes different. The Holy Spirit now lives on the inside of your heart, and he contends with you. And you can't just live any old way that you want to. But one of the first things that I want you to see, sins which were by the law. I wanted you to kind of get a, he a heads up on that because that's where we're transitioning into is the law's relationship with sin and what, what ends up happening to the life of the believer, too, in addition to unbelievers, once you're a believer, if you don't understand how, to, how all this works, that's why we call, I'm calling it the broken engine. Because if you don't understand how this stuff is supposed to work, you shut down and you're not moving forward, okay? And so this is not supposed to be the normal Christian life. The believer also can have those motions, which means inward affliction of sin, active in their own lives. Sadly, this is the life of many believers in that they do not understand proper faith that delivers them from the power of sin. All right, verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. Amen? So this word delivered means that you've been released, that this thing that was going on in your life is idle now. So the thought, once again, is not that the believer leads a life of lawlessness. You can't, you can't just live any old way you want. Instead, the power of the Holy Spirit energizes the believer and allows that power to be released, which results in victory instead of failure. And this way, Jesus kept and fulfilled the law, and now in our union or connection with him, we are identified in him by the Father as the law being accomplished. So in other words, the law was already accomplished in our lives through Jesus. And now that we keep our faith in Christ, we're given power from the Holy Spirit that helps us to, to, to kind of keep the law. Can I say it like that? And what, what, what are you saying? Well, you know, maybe you didn't commit adultery, okay? Well, that's a good thing. But you coveted another man's wife. I mean, you broke the commandment. You know, you, um, you, didn't, you, didn't, um, you didn't murder anybody, but Jesus said, if you hated someone in your heart, you've already committed murder. Oh, but that's not the same, Okay think that it, it can mess up your it'll mess up your spiritual walk with the lord there you go again relative righteousness i never killed nobody but i hate people it ain't no difference in the mind of god how do you know that preacher because jesus said it if you you didn't murder but you hate it in your heart you committed murder in your heart spiritually speaking okay and so um in him, we have identified in him by the Father as the law being accomplished. But as we walk in the Spirit, which is to trust in the work of Christ, to trust in his performance and not our own, grace empowers and we are supernaturally strengthened to walk in a way where our lives are pleasing to the Lord. You know, <laughs> I mean, I would imagine, have y'all ever known anybody that just lied, man? Lie, I'm talking about lie so bad, bro. Like, just lie, 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 lie. I've told y'all before, like, I was in the world, and I can't say I never lied because then I'd be a liar. But what I'm trying to say is that wasn't one of my big problems. If anything, I had a problem telling the truth too much living in that world like that because that don't go over well when you're too honest, right? I'd make all kinds of mistakes, and then I'd admit to it, all right? And, but, but nevertheless, you know, God, when he does a work on the inside of our heart, he can turn a person from being a liar to a truth speaker. Amen. He can turn a person, you know, that's bound with lust to, to change the thoughts on the inside of a person's head. God is the only one that can do that. You can't put good, you can try to put good thoughts in your head, 
And it's always better to read the word and to expose yourself to godly things instead of negative things. But all of that, if you're thinking that that's going to make the thoughts in your head get better, you're going to be sadly mistaken because you're going to end up still having some bad thoughts in your head. You need the work of the Holy Spirit to change on the inside. And, you know, that's another way that you can try to live according to the law, right? I mean, that's just a good example. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch Fireproof instead of, you know, I don't know what name of movie that's out right now. I don't know. Some bad movie. I can't think of one right off the top of my head. Huh? What? Stranger Things? Okay. I don't know nothing about Stranger Things. But, uh, but I'm... So everybody's like, golly, man, why y'all want to call me out? <laughs> y'all watching Stranger Things. Stranger Things are going to happen to you when you turn your light off. All right, but anyway, <laughs> what, I, what I'm trying to say is, is this. You can try to watch Fireproof instead of Stranger Things, and you think, see, man, look, I'm doing righteous stuff, but guess what? Next thing you know, you'll be thinking stranger things in your head because no because now you're trusting in your good works that that's what's fixing your head and making your head right and what I'm trying to say is that that is not what makes your head right the Holy Spirit doing the work and changing the thoughts in your heart and in your mind amen now that don't mean that you should go around watching stranger things and be like I'm protected by the blood of the lamb my brain my mind is is you know I don't understand why people watch. I don't know what Stranger Things is, but I'm thinking it's demonic because I think I might have saw like the little witch in the diggy on the on the advertisement. And uh, I'm just saying, like, I don't understand. And listen, I'm not judging. I'm just trying to say, like, I guess I was never into horror movies. I can remember watching Children of the Corn when I was like 18 years old with my boys, and I was just like, dude, this is like, I was my heart was beating fast. It was just, it's the demonic stuff that I'm just like. I don't want this, man. I, don't, I didn't, wasn't even a believer, and I'm just like, man, this stuff ain't right, bro. I don't want to have nothing to do with it. Now, y'all do what you want, but I'm, I don't recommend it. Because then, then, they, then they start wondering why, why I can't sleep at night, why weird stuff's happening, why I heard something fall in the other room, why, why I'm waking up. Well, I'm going to tell you why. You done open up a door, my friend. All right, but anyway. All right, so uh, you should serve in newness of the Spirit, not in the letter. Verse 7, verse 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So we talked about that earlier. And, and, and so the law, as we will see moving forward, is not the problem. The law in and of itself is not the problem. It, it, the problem is sin. However, the law arouses sinful passions. Does that make sense? It gives power to sin. That's what, as a matter of fact, while we're here, I used this scripture the other day, but now let's use it in this context. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. It says, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So the law will tell you what, what is sin, but it also arouses sinful passions. All right. So <laughs> the, the Greek scholar that I like to read behind a lot of times, there's this little rhyme. I don't think he wrote it. I think he got it from somebody else. But it says, do this and, li do this and live the law commands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. A better word the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. So the law says, this is what I demand from you. I demand holy thoughts, holy living, holy this, holy that. But it doesn't have the power source connected to it to give you the ability to be able to do what God's calling you to do. Amen? All right. And so, and, and, and so, and so sin gets its strength. Does that make sense? Because it's important that you see this little scripture here, the strength of sin is law, because when we're getting into this, other stuff here in Romans in just a second, then that kind of concept is still going to be is going to be spoken of. All right. So in verse nine, there's a little bit of a shifting gears here. Paul was using second person pronouns. He was talking about you and we, but now he starts he starts to use the first person, and he's talking about himself. And more specifically, more importantly, the apostle Paul is talking about here about him about his 
his own experiences. So if you've been a Christian, like I don't want you to raise your hand because I'm not trying to make you feel weird, but I want you to think in your heart and in your mind whether or not you really do believe that you have a revelation of the cross. Because, and what, what, how would you know if you had a revelation of the cross? Because there might have been something specifically in your life before that you that was plaguing you and you couldn't get free from no matter what you were trying to do. So what did you try to, before you, before you ever came to this church or before you ever heard the message of the cross, how, if you were a Christian for a long time, how would you try to get victory over that thing? Would you try to read more of your Bible maybe? Fast, fast you would fast, okay? Now fasting's good, right? And, and reading the word of God's very good, right? And you, you would try to pray more, right? Um, I, I told you all the story before when I was in the pipe yard and I went and told the preacher, I was like, I, I'm struggling with lust. Like my brain is filled with lust the whole shift while I'm out there cleaning that pipe. You just need to pray in tongues more, brother. And so I would. I would try to pray in tongues more. I don't even know if I was baptized in the Holy Spirit then, but I was trying. I was trying to do whatever I could do. And sometimes we'd rebuke the devil, right? we rebuke the devil. And we have authority over the devil in the name of Christ, amen? But the problem is, is that when you start putting your faith in these things, see, if you don't understand the, the message of the cross, the finished work of Christ, then the tendency is for you to start putting your faith in some type of a formula for victory. And so you start, don't re even realize it, but your faith is, your faith, oh man, your faith is not in Christ, dude. What are you talking about? Of course my faith is in Jesus. I'm not talking about to get to heaven. Yeah, your faith is in Jesus to get to heaven. That's where anybody that's a true Christian, their faith is in Jesus to get to heaven. All the preachers ought to be preaching that. They may not be, but they should be. That's, that's, that's simple stuff. But how do you live for God? See, whenever you're in the midst of the struggle and the trial and the tribulation, how do you live for God? See, if you change the object of your faith from Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross and understand that that's what makes you righteous and that's what allows you to have access by, of grace from the Holy Spirit. If you change your object of your faith from Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross to something else, the Bible says in the book of Galatians, you frustrate the grace of God. I'm going to let you see it just so you believe me. Galatians 5 and 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other so that you could not do what you would. Oh, well, I thought I had the right scripture right there, but we're not going to give up, right? We can just Google it. <laughs> Enter Galatians 2.20, 2.21. Well, what's interesting, now check this out. Now, how beautiful is this? If this isn't God. Look at verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, message of the cross. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Now the life which I now live in the flesh, this is different this time, it's talking about your physical body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then he says this, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So one of the things that you and I need to understand is, is that if you're thinking that righteousness comes from the doing of the law, again, you need to understand actions that you think your performance is going to make you holy, then you end up frustrating the grace of God in your life. The very thing that's supposed to help you and strengthen you, you're frustrating it because you're putting your faith in something else other than what Jesus did for you at the cross. I mean, just think about the logic behind this. I, listen, I could sit here. I've already, uh, I, I got to be careful. Robert told me, he reminded me at the school night. So I got to be careful. But I could start from the beginning of Genesis and I could work my way all the way through the book of Revelation and I could tell you how many times the work of Christ was spoken of, symbolized, shown to you. Whether it be from the beginning in the garden with the killing of the innocent animal, whether it be from the Passover with the, the painting on the doorpost, whether it be from Rahab the harlot and her scarlet thread, the, uh, you know, that rhymes, huh? The harlot had scarlet. Whether it be from that to, to you know, the sacrificial system. I, I mean, I don't really have to keep going on, right? It is like the message is there. So what I'm trying to say is God put all of this work into communicating the very plan of God. And so my point is, is that he's not going to change it. No, instead, he's going to further reveal it. Amen. All right. So let's go ahead and skip forward so that we don't miss the punchline here. 
So in this shifting of gears, um, whenever we get into uh, verse, verse 9, he says, this is, this is what I want. This is so important right here. If you, if you miss this one, you're gonna miss the, you miss the whole chapter, really, in my opinion. Because, look, scholars are divided on what this means. But this is the verse that really touched me in my living room when Lauren was saying it. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. All right, now, so what I want you to know what scholars believe. Many scholars, and especially like Baptist scholars definitely believe this, um, but really most scholars. What they say Paul was talking about alive without the law once was when he was a child. And that he did not understand the law. And that once he came to of age and he understood the law, then the law caused sin to come alive in his heart. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? I mean, you can definitely read that in there. Yeah, so you get the age of accountability. Yeah, something like that. Yep. Yeah. So you can definitely get that to, to some extent out of this. But, what I, but my only point that I want to do is, is that what did we talk about in Romans 6 over and over again? About dying in Christ, about death, spiritual death, the old man dying in Christ, death, de- death, death. What did we start off Romans 7 talking about? Death. And the change that's taking place, death to the old man, is really what we've been talking about in Romans 6 and in Romans 7, death to the old man. Right? So why, So now if he says, for I speak to them that know the law, for the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. That's what he said, right? Y'all remember that? Romans chapter 7, verse 1. I speak to them that know the law, for the law has dominion or lordship over a man as long as he lives. And then he goes through the whole illustration of marriage between a husband and a wife and that when the husband dies, she's released from the law. And then he explains that And you, you've been released from the law because you died in Christ and now you're married to Jesus, right? And so why would he now all of a sudden shift gears in verse 9 and talk about something that was in his childhood when he's been talking about dying in Christ, right? right? And so I'm trying to tell you that what he's saying here is I was alive without the law at one point in time. And let me just tell you this other thing here. This word revived right here. I'll just add another color to it. This word revived right here, literally, it, 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 well, let me just show you this, if I can get to it. No, I think it's in uh, Romans, what is it? Romans, yeah, Romans 14, 9. This word is used twice in the New Testament. Okay, let me just get rid of this highlight because that yellow's aggravating. All right. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived. You see that right there? Now, what does that mean? What, what, does, what, what, does this, what is this saying? It says that Jesus was alive, Jesus died, and Jesus came back to life, right? Only two times in the New Testament is this word used. And look what the, the, literal, the literal meaning of the word is to be alive again, to live again, to live again or recover life, to revive, regain strength and vigor, right? So it's the same exact word. All right, as a matter of fact, I can show you right there. Um, you know, I, well, I said that the word was only used twice, but it's used twice in the book of Romans is what I meant. It's been a long time since I've looked at that. All right, so here you go. The word revived. All right, so now let's go back to that. So, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So if sin revived, and the word revived means to gain life again, What does that mean? That means that sin had been alive, had died, and came back to life again, right? Does that make sense? Is it not the same thing that I was just telling you about Jesus? So how, so even if you want to say, okay, Paul was just a young man, and and he didn't know what the law was yet, and so when he knew the law, then that caused sin to come alive in his heart. That's not what it's saying. It's saying it revived. Okay, number one. Number two, how is sin how is sin killed in your life? Is it because you're young? That was Brother Larson's famous little thing, and I just love that analogy when he said, you think that a kid doesn't have a sinful nature in him? <laughs> oh, let me just tell you, get one crib, two 15-month-old children, one rubber ducky, throw it in there, back up, watch the show. 
Because you're going to see some brutal stuff probably going on, right? Them two kids are going to start scrapping for that rubber ducky, maybe. I mean, some kids are more sweet in nature, but you get the point. In other words, you don't have to teach them that. Isabella used to say that all the time when she was young. It's mine. And she would growl about it. My dad thought that was hilarious. I'm like, dude, don't promote that. You know, it's mine. And, and kids are selfish, and they want what belongs to them. So the point to that is, though, is that the sinful nature is already in a child. You don't have to teach that. So that doesn't make any sense. So when the Apostle Paul is saying, after all this stuff he's saying, listen, I want to explain to you that, that, listen, you were under the dominion of law, but like this marriage analogy and the husband dies, you died in Christ. Now you're married to Christ. And look, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So how are you going to explain this to me? preacher to help me understand this. I don't know what Paul did, but he added something to his faith. Okay, now use yourself as an example if you've ever been free. For me personally, all I can do is use myself as an example. When I worked offshore, I told you all the story before, I got saved, I went offshore, I didn't dip skull for two whole weeks, and I didn't do nothing but read my Bible the whole two weeks that I was out there. And when I went back to church, the preacher, meaning all well, said, you gave your heart to the Lord, now you got some stuff you got to start doing, son. You got to get up in this church, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this, you got to read more word, you got to do these things. She meant well, but she did not, because she didn't understand this, to try to explain it to me. You don't put your faith in what you're doing. You put your faith in what Jesus already did. Then guess what happens? A natural gravitation to put faith in your works instead of the work of the Lord. Sin revived, and I began to die spiritually from that point. Moving forward and died spiritually for at least 12 years and struggled in my walk with the Lord uh, for at least 12 years, all right? So we're going to close there because it's getting kind of late, and uh, we, I didn't really get as far as I wanted to. But, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the truth, O oh Lord God, that the old man died in Christ to sin, but that he also died in Christ to the dominion of the law. The law is no longer our Lord. You are. And when we keep our faith in you, grace flows into our heart and our life. The old man has died in Christ. A new man has been resurrected to newness of life. Your grace strengthens us, encourages us, helps our walk in you. We put our hope and trust in you, Lord. Help us to understand that all this is a gift given by you that you purchased for us through the shedding of your blood. We don't deserve it, but you, gave, you did it for us. The Father gave us the gift and that we're to keep our faith in you, Lord, and understand that we're dependent on you. That when we find ourselves struggling in something, we have to get to the place where we cry out to you and we say, Lord, I can't do it. I need you to do it. Just like the Apostle Paul will say later in this chapter when he says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The thing I don't want to do is what I'm doing. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah.